Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And Mark, thank you for that incredible presentation. Uh, I thought I was going to see the same one I saw last night, but different pictures today and different, uh, uh, different stories. Um, I, I, I just wanted to thank President Schaefer for uh, building this place so we could all be here today. It's just amazing. And, you know, uh, when I got here, everyone told me that President Schaefer was a transformational president for the University of Arizona, and it was uh, somewhat uh, intimidating to be following the John Wooden of uh, university presidents. <laughs> but thank you very much for your friendship and all the support you've given me in the uh, nearly two years I've been here. And uh, at not only here, but um, the Poetry Center, uh, all of the things uh, that you've done to encourage uh, investment in research uh, and discovery at this university, we're incredibly blessed. And we just happened, I wish I could take credit for all this stuff, but we just happened to get Annie to, uh, to come back to Tucson from sh uh, Chicago, and she's doing great things. And uh, we went through a strategic planning process for the university recently. It's about a year-long process engaged with over 10,000 people, and one of, the, uh, one of the focuses of that strategic plan is going to be reimagining this incredible art district that we have on the campus. Uh, I think you all know better than I do. We've got the top university-based dance program. We've got an incredible uh, art collection, um, as one of our potential donors told me recently. You've got a great collection of art and a very poor building. So. Uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, there will be some replacement for Centennial Hall or some uh, renovation <laughs> and that we will have uh, Fred Fox uh, School of Music and all the great assets that we have here uh, for the university really be part of the next campaign and as President Schaefer was doing he was he was setting me up to ask you all for money <laughs> so uh, we, we look forward to you helping us with that and and many other people who love this great university. So Mark, we're, we're here uh, uh, again this year celebrating uh, Ansel Adams' birthday. What, what kind of relationship uh, uh, did you have with Ansel? Well, I, I, had, I never had the opportunity to meet Ansel Adams. He's one of the people that I wish many, many times I could have talked to for 15 minutes, but uh, well, we just talk to President. Well, I've, been, I've been trying to do that. Yes. I've, I've tried to do that, and it's it's working. It's very it's very special to to meet Mr. Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer, and to be able to talk to you about the your relationship with Ansel Adams, and to feel a little more connected to all that. So it's very truly very special. Um, you know, my relationship today is thinking of Ansel Adams as just one of great respect for what he did at his time, and uh, you know, he was a, a huge pioneer in photography and also in photography as an art form. Uh, a true technician, I think, um, in, in his craft and uh, someone that was always the very high benchmark for me to try to, you know, um, work toward, you know, what he did. I, I think, you know, going backwards to my youth, I, I started in photography at a very, very young age, probably, you know, eight eight, nine years old, I remember being very interested in photography. And as soon as I, I, I forget what age I was, probably early teens though, I, I had the book, uh, the three books by him that were right beside my bed in a little bed stand that was between my brother and I's twin beds, the, the camera, the negative, the print that he did. And totally just buried myself in those three books. Um, and that was really the, I think the foundation for everything that I did later on in photography. But, um, you know, someone I was developing film, you know, probably before I was 15 years old in the dark room in the house and, you know, just really jumped into it in that way. So self-taught, I, you know, kind of learned everything on my own, but those three books were instrumental. Uh, so Ansel Adams was always someone who I looked up to. At a, he was at a very high, high spot. Uh, and I did a lot of other types of photography, as you heard, the uh, professional sports photography. Um, that was back in 35 millimeter days and big manual focus lenses and quite different than it is today. And then uh, got into a lot of commercial photography and 
was shooting with um, medium format film and 4x5 film at that time. And the, I had a studio 4x5 Cambo camera that uh, I want to show one more picture in a second. But the, uh, the camera that these cameras, when you look through the, the, uh, the ground glass, I've got I've to show this to you real fast. Because it's very interesting. And it's something I wanted to point out. When you look through the ground glass on one of these cameras, it's Let's see, it is, this is, say, this is the photograph that I want to end up with, is something like this. So if you're in that scene taking that picture, this is what it looks like when you're looking through the ground glass. <laughs> Everything, with any, any of these cameras, the, the taller two cameras or the studio camera, everything is upside down and it's backwards. So you have to get used to kind of flipping yourself around that. And, <laughs> The, uh, to, to see that in that way. But the, what I was going to say is when I did the studio photography, I was fortunate enough that they had these binocular reflex hoods that you could buy for them, and they would flip it all around for you again. So you, it was much easier to do that sort of photography. And that was technology that had come along to, to, to that point. And then digital now is taken over in commercial photography. But um, that's, that's what it looks like when you're looking through the ground glass. Yeah. Uh. If you have seizure disorder, don't don't try this <laughs> out in the field. So yeah. Becky, tell tell us should what should we leave that or should we put it back to what you were going for? <laughs> uh, okay, we'll put it back. But Brian can probably do it. Okay, Brian will do it. <laughs> I just don't want to leave the audience hanging. Yeah. <laughs> Becky, set set for uh, the, it sounds like a lot of experts in the room who were controlling the light and thank you for whoever shouted that out, turn the house lights down because those <laughs> images really came, came to life. But uh, for, for mere uh, mortals like me, can you just set the, uh, the importance of having Ansel Adams work here and, and maybe even some of the other photographers you have. I was watching the reel uh, as Annie was taking me around the uh, Avendon show there of, of how he spoke, I think it was the opening of this, uh, this center, which with all of your help, we're going to make, uh, we're going to revitalize this place and who knows, maybe even build a new auditorium so everybody who couldn't get in could have gotten in today. <laughs> but what's the significance of having the work here? Well, I think it's important to think of Ansel Adams's archive here as an anchor for a larger research collection. So, I mean, we're always delighted when we do something about Ansel Adams and we fill the auditorium and we have all of these visitors because he's a name that people know. But Ansel himself did not think he was building a museum of Ansel Adams. His investment was in the medium of photography. And so what he was creating in an institution like the center was a place where the archives, as Dr. Schaefer said, could be held so that researchers from all over the world with questions he could not yet imagine could come to Tucson and do research in those materials to answer their queries. And literally today, we host researchers from all over the world who come to Tucson and use those resources. And what's so exciting about this moment is with University of Arizona's interest in interdisciplinary studies, um, the resources are available to photo historians, people who are writing about the creative process or about specific photographs or trying to better understand how photography has impacted our culture at large. But those same resources are available to people studying psychology or people studying architecture. They can all look at those photographs and see different things in the same materials. And so it, it multiplies vastly what this collection is able to do. And so that's a really powerful thing. And of course, we're incredibly proud to have Ansel Adams's work. His influence is incredible. Um, some of you may have read in the newspapers about this Museum of Fine Arts Boston exhibition that's been going on called Ansel Adams in Our Time. And it's about the relationship between Adams and the way he has influenced the photographers of the 21st century. And Mark is another example. Not that the influence needs to be immediate or direct, but Ansel Adams built a foundation that every photographer who practices today stands on, whether or not they know it, because he was so instrumental in changing what we thought photography could do 
and how we valued it as an intrinsic expressive language. And so all of us continue to benefit from those, those things that he did. And then he helped invite other people to join and their archives to come. There were many artists who wanted to be seen alongside Ansel Adams, so that brought other work to the center and to the University of Arizona. And so we now have a collection that is almost 100,000 photographs, over 250 archives. And so we have this incredibly powerful research tool right, right, right here. That's fantastic. And, and I know that uh, uh, Annie and, uh, and the staff and you uh, have uh, had the vision to, uh, to take the current coat check room mm -hmm. and turn that into an interdisciplinary gallery. And I, of course, have been espousing the, uh, the vision of the fourth industrial revolution and getting our students ready for the fast changing world that's out there. And I just love the interdisciplinary nature uh, that uh, that that gallery will bring and bring alive, and certainly the Kennerly uh, collection will be a big part of that as well. And and David was here last year, um, so Mark, uh, uh, I'm going to go off script here. Which how much time do we actually have? All afternoon. <laughs> That's what I like. It's 1:47. Are we supposed to be 15 minutes? So I I want to let the audience. Uh, uh, have a chance to ask uh, Mark and Becky questions, but I, I it's, this is not on here. But uh, when when you and uh, and Craig came off the road and you had the the big opening event for um, for the uh, for the National Parks Project, you did it in uh, College Station at the uh, Bush Forty One uh, Museum. And you had Ken Burns there. Is he related to you? No, no okay, relation. So we at all. get that out no. of the way. But he he did a he did all the national parks and of course the the video version of what you did. But just talk about how the two of you because you had a similar panel that night talking with Ken Burns and about right. the project. Well, it was it's that, that's a great question because actually the Ken Burns Dayton Duncan book, the National Parks America's Best Idea was actually reading a paragraph in there that gave me the idea to do this project. They, they said in the opening of the book that it was arguably the work of the early work of the uh, photographers and painters out west that led to many of those lands becoming established as national parks in the beginning, more so than the businessmen and the scientists. And when I read that, I thought, you know, wow, you know, it's like I said, I'm a photographer. I could go out and photograph them at the 100 year anniversary and show that they're, they're still, you know, they're, they're great, as great as they were. And, and my, the black and white for me was the medium I love to work in, but it also to me was that bridge back to the medium they were working in and, and that, at that 1916 period. So it worked really well to, for me to say I wanted to produce a project in black and white and go out and photograph all 59 parks. But Ken, uh, that and I, you know, he certainly knows that now. We stay in touch via email, but we had no, no relation other than having the same last name. Um, but he, boy, what an American gem he is. Uh, we got to know each other a little bit about, you know, talking in the green room before we went out, and, and we had lunch with George and Barbara Bush that day in the apartment before the event, and um, just. Um, amazing source of knowledge on American history and I was just couldn't say enough about that but was glad uh, honored to have him there at the opening of the uh, yeah of the that, event. Was, that was a very cool event so Becky before we get to questions from the audience kind of uh, frame for us the importance of of Ansel Adams work through a you know we've got one of the the greatest collections of uh, of uh, scientists working on climate change and ecology and sustainability and resilience. Um, we, we got to go out to the biosphere this morning mm. and see it in <laughs> snow, uh, which probably you know, hasn't happened too many times. Although when I was talking to John Adams, he said it actually uh, snows more frequently than I was aware. But, but just the work that Ansel Adams and others did and, and kind of pick up on what Mark was saying around conservation and the importance of photography in, in that movement. Yeah, Ansel Adams uh, was an early member of the Sierra Club, and it was the Sierra Club before the Sierra Club we know today, the big 
uh, political action committee. The Sierra Club was originally a hiking club for people who were in the Sierra. I mean, that's, that's what it was. That's where that name comes from. And so he was very much a part of the John Muir school of thinking, which was that the way that you protected the wilderness was to connect people to it. And that if people had a relationship and they went out in nature and they knew how to hike and they knew what the geology was and they knew what, which trees were which, they would feel attached to it and that would cause them to want to protect it. And so Ansel Adams was always someone who promoted um, use of the parks. He, he didn't feel like you should wall them off and, and have that space be separate but rather the idea was to get people out into it because that was how they were going to care and that was what was going to make them invested. And certainly people have been critical of that kind of approach because there are um, those who would like to see wilderness kept very pristine. And Adams, over his years, fought for um, roads not to be built or new areas to be protected. But I think we see in his photography and the photography of those who followed him, a desire to create pictures that allow the viewer of the picture to understand the emotional experience he felt when he was in the wilderness. He's trying to bring that experience to us. And in that way, help us, when we're standing here in the gallery, have the same kind of deep attachment to those wilderness places that the people who are out in them have. And so it, it I mean, his work did actually lead to uh, the creation of Kings Canyon National Park. Um, but, but I think m much more broadly, his investment in wilderness spaces and their um, preservation through his images have encouraged other people to think about the importance of those protected lands. And then we see photographers like Mark um, appreciating that intention and then following through on it themselves. And that then extends that legacy and investment in picturing those parklands for people who, who, can't, who either can't see them firsthand or that acts as an impulse to get those people back to those parklands and to enjoy them. Having spent a long time in the Bay Area, I don't think Ansel Adams uh, could have envisioned the aggressive mountain bikers that took over some of the trails, but I think there's the taunt there. Uh, what questions do you have from the audience? Oh, right there. Quick. Could you discuss briefly the process and challenges of preservation of your archives here? Oh, yeah, so the question is the, the process and challenges of the preservation of the archive. I mean, I think the most fundamental challenge is balancing access and preservation, right? So if we were going to keep the things forever and ever, we would always keep them in the dark, they would always be kept at the same humidity, and they would always be kept at the same temperature, and none of you would ever get to see them. <laughs> and they would last forever. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. They wouldn't last forever. Um, but, but what we try to do is balance people's access to them because it doesn't matter if we keep them if nobody ever gets to see them. So the general rule for light sensitive materials like photographs is six months of exposure for every 10 years. So we put things on view. We keep track of how long they're on view. They're under UV protected plexi. We measure how much light exposure they're getting, so we keep the lights relatively low in the gallery. You may have noticed that. But then when they go back in their box, they stay in their box um, for about 10 years before they come out again. And in that way, we're able to extend their life over many generations of human people so that lots of different people get to see them. Thank well, you for that question. Yeah, that's it's an a great excellent question. question. In the back, back, Leah. My question is Mr. Burns. When you set up your scheduling process mm -hmm. and you were logistically understanding that, okay, I've only, you know, I've got five years to get across 59 parks. Right. And you were actually also trying to choose which season do I shoot them in because there is a constant change in beauty. Right. So how did you, you know, you talked a little bit about a feedback loop there where you would go and you would see something and you wanted to do it again. Right. But how did you conceptually first start on grouping and then determining which seasons? 
Would, well, you, would you repeat back the, the question briefly? Yeah, the question briefly. was Just how briefly. I, how I uh, kind of Sorry. Yeah, worked out the scheduling to photograph all 59 parks in the five-year period that I had, and you had different seasons to work with, obviously, which was a big, big part of it. Um, and, and a lot of the parks I went to multiple times in multiple seasons to try to get uh, different uh, looks there. And, you know, some parks like, you know, parks where you're going to have snow in the winter can add a whole another beautiful layer to it. Um, and that same park could also look different but very beautiful in the, you know, summer. So at some parks uh, like Death Valley, for example, you know, they, they don't, change much in look summer to winter, but they're way, way, way hotter in the summer than the winter, so I tried to go there in the winter. So there were a lot of, like, the, the first thing was I'm looking at, at parks that were kind of in the southwest area. So I, I kind of did it by quadrants to start with. So it was kind of Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona, and California, and Nevada was kind of the, the southwest quadrant of what parks in there, and then looking at what weather I would have on this trip if I planned it now or if I, like for Yosemite, I always tried to do Yosemite in very late April or, or throughout May because the waterfalls are, were really rushing then. So to get the waterfall shots, it was always either early to late May. And then when I went back probably three times to try to get some snow photography in Yosemite and that was at the big, the snow drought of the Yosemite <laughs> Valley for three or four years. and. The, the, the winter after, you know, six weeks after the exhibit opened, it was record snowfall there. So <laughs> that was the kind of thing. That was, that was the one, you know, beat my head on the wall that I, I want to go back and get some, spend some really quality time in Yosemite when there's some nice snow there because it's something I think that makes that location very beautiful. But it was, there was a lot of challenge to the scheduling and a lot of, a lot of thinking and planning and mapping out the mileage. And I had to work from in sort of loops, you know, going from, I'll start here and go to this park and go to this park. And then once I would get out in those parks, though, I had, I had built an iPad uh, on a big holder inside the FJ Cruiser that I drove around that was mounted right next to me. And on, with the apps you can get nowadays, I could pull up wind directions, I could pull up, you know, live radar for the country, all this incredible stuff. And so I could be in one park looking at a storm system about to blow into a park 200 miles away and I'd say, well, that's a four hour drive from here. I'm gonna pack up because it's not happening here and head right to that park because you're looking at live radar. And that's the kind of stuff that was, that was pretty cool that kind of played into all the scheduling. But um, it was quite a challenge working all that out. Maybe, soon soon maybe. it'll be, uh, you'll just have it all in Google glasses. <laughs> the individual images from the groups, um, that's a great question because, you know, the, it's so, it would, that was got to be really difficult to try to pick one photograph. And I had to pick one photograph because the, there just wasn't wall space and room to put more than the 59 photos when, they're, when the photographs ended up being framed about this big and you got to have space in between. And the galleries all averaged about 3,500 square feet or whatever. I mean, I, it, there was a math involved that said, okay, the pictures, you know, you can only have one of each park. And it, we, I had an advisory committee and I tried to, you know, sort of steer what the prints were going to be from each park. And in some cases I said, this is going to be the photograph for that park because I love this one. But in other cases with bigger parks like Yellowstone and, and Yosemite and uh, Grand Canyon, I, I, would, I would select maybe three or four of my final choices. And, go show them at, uh, you know, in a conference room or whatever with the eight or nine of the advisory committee members and they would, they would say, oh, it has to be this, has to be that. And a good example is the Old Faithful photo. Yellowstone, I, I had, there's a, several other photographs that I really personally loved from, from Yellowstone National Park and Old Faithful. Everybody said, well, you're not going to have Old Faithful in the exhibit? I mean, it has to be in the exhibit. I said, well, we're picking one photo, you know, and it, if it's not that one, it's this one. So that's, that, that came into play was uh, that the, these iconic spots that have been photographed and painted for centuries uh, are, they're iconic because people love to look at them and they're great, great views. Tunnel view it used to be inspiration point in Yosemite is just, that's a, that, that view is never going to not be spectacular. So how many miles did you put on the FJ Cruiser? I drove during the project, uh, project miles, 160,000. 
So the, the, that was uh, four and a half years. Uh, the vehicle went to every national park in the lower 48 uh, at least once and multiple times to some of them. So Google and uh, I don't know how many, we were going to give a test, but uh, not, none of you could pass it. But how many, how many of the 60 national parks could you actually write down and name? After you get past about 10 or 15, it gets tough. What, what's the furthest away? Uh, that people probably don't know there's one in the South Pacific. <laughs> yeah, so I was showing you this because at the end of the whole project, my truck became a celebrity and, and I was broke. So <laughs> that's, that's what happened. But we, we thought we were going to get this thing funded by Toyota, but we just never quite yeah, got there. They, the, uh, the, 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 one of the museums was so in, impressed with the vehicle that they put it out for six months in front of the museum with reader rails around it. And I would come up there, you know, once a week or so to check on the exhibit and whatever. And there'd be 15 or 20 people standing around looking at my truck, you know. <laughs> and I'd walk by and reach in my pocket and click the, click the key clicker and make the horn hump. But anyway, um, the, yeah. the, the farther, furthest most park is American Samoa National Park out near uh, in the South Pacific, and that was a very interesting park to visit and to photograph. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, planning went in, involved into getting there. They, the, the flights drop you off on a Sunday night about 1130, and they pick you up a week later. So you're kind of there for the week. And um, Good. It's a good place to be. Yeah. My, my producer is telling me in my ear that we got to wrap this up, <laughs> although... Uh, I took my earpiece out, and, and, but Annie's about to give me this. There were a couple other questions right there. Yes. I'm curious about your use of lighting. Uh, at least from your presentation, you spoke more about sunlight and mm -hmm. catching the light at dawn. And I was wondering, did you use any of the dust lighting as you were coming to sunset? Mm -hmm. Well, dawn is, I think, just a, a magical time when the, the levels are, you're starting from much lower and it's very slowly coming up, where in the afternoon, when you have harsher light, you're starting with the harsher light and you're hoping that it kind of softens. But in, uh, that's a great question because I, I you know, got very specific about what I would look for in the atmosphere for lighting when I was doing shots. And any time you had a, a real, like a thin cloud layer near the horizon, if the sun's up here, but you got this little thin cloud layer, not like big puffy clouds, but you know, just a thin band of clouds, as the sun is gonna come down into that, I know that I'm gonna have this, this moment where when, the, when it feathers into that cloud, right at that point where it starts feathering in, that's when you see all of a sudden the hard <laughs> shadows just start to open up. And so you have directional light, but the shadows just open up, and that's when I'm taking the picture. And that may be 30 seconds, it may be 60 seconds, but it's really, it, it, it happens and it's quick. But if you have bands of clouds and the sun may go in and out of them, and it may be harsh light, then it goes in the cloud and it softens up, and then it comes out and it's harsh, then it softens up, but it's at, the, it's at each edge. Right at that edge, when it feathers in and feathers out, that's when I'm taking the photograph. Marie Timmett is the uh, president of the graduate and professional student organization at the University of Arizona and one of my bosses. I, I have to meet with her every month and she tells me what to do for that month. So <laughs> Marie is a, is, uh, is a art historian and particularly interested in photography. So I, I think, does she get the last word? It's like Lawrence O'Donnell, the last word? Or do we, can we keep going? Do we have more time? because maybe we have to do this again. Okay, Marie, you get the last word. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm curious, you mentioned the kind of iconic nature of the photographs that are selected. How did you approach taking these iconic photographs that have been photographed again and again and again, and also challenging yourself to make them your own? And making them your own? Well, would, you, it's, would you repeat that back just briefly? Yeah, it, it's kind of... Um, the question is, when you have iconic spots like many, so many of these spots are, especially when you have to pick one from each park that's been, it's become iconic over years um, because of the popularity of the, you know, of, of a visual image that sometimes goes back to a painting from the 1850s. 
perhaps when when people first went through there and artists said, oh, look, look at this beautiful vista, I'm going to paint that, and then photographers photograph it and it just becomes an iconic spot and it becomes synonymous with when you think of Yellowstone, you think of Old Faithful. So um, it's very, it, that was very, very difficult. You know, I, I had to kind of tell myself I'm not going to try so hard to separate myself from what the other people did. I'm just going to go photograph the, the spot because we had to pick one for that exhibit. And that, you know, the, the back side of it is I have a big body of work that hasn't really been seen yet that is a lot of some of the other stuff that's out there that as I go look through things now that I photographed six, seven years ago, I go, oh, I forgot I took that. That's, wow, I, how did that slip by? You know, I really like it. And so it's that, there's a lot of that there that I'm looking at now that were kind of the, the B stuff for the exhibit because they weren't the iconic spot. But um, it, I, I had to just tell myself, it's gonna be a lot of the iconic spots that everybody else has done. Um, and, you know, and you people relate back to what Ansel Adams photographed, and Ansel Adams may have been looking at a painting that Thomas Moran did, you know, or a photograph that Carlton Watkins took. So there's, you know, there's reasons that those spots become beautiful, beautiful spots. It's because, you know, when you, as an artist, when you, if you're looking at a scene and you say, well, if I walk about 50 yards over here, it's really going to get great. And then you fine tune that about 10 feet and you say, this is perfect, you know, and it's still that same spot that's the view, you know. I, I was blessed, I, I knew nothing about any of this stuff, of course, and, but I was blessed to get to go with my son Craig and Mark on a couple of these trips. And what I didn't understand, but now every day when I drive toward the Catalinas, uh, and Mark hinted at this in, in some of his commentaries, I think you can tell he likes the clouds. But it's all about the light, as you well know. And some days the Catalinas look totally different mm -hmm. than they do on other days. And today it was incredible with the snow on them. I, of course, never seen that. So thank you all for being here, Mark. Thank you for thank a great you. presentation. I'm, I'm sure Mark will be here to ask, answer all your questions. Sure. It's like holding clinic.